Yeah, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last in our series of, of seminars to celebrate Open Education Week. And um, yeah, I hope you found the uh, seminars and workshops today interesting and engaging, and uh, this one will be too. So I want to welcome Anna and, and Steph from, uh, from Dixon Library, who are going to be talking to us about how to create and engage with open educational resources. So um, I'll leave it to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mitch. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Duchesne, and I'm the manager of Library Academic Services and Outreach. And today we're going to be talking, Steph, digital experience librarian, Steph Forbes, will be talking about um, a bit about copyright and IP and ownership of um, teaching and learning outputs as well as research outputs. And um, looking at then what we can make open, selecting the correct license once you've decided um, the work that you want to focus on to make open, and then looking at platforms on where to share the kinds of formats that you can use, um, the notion of peer review in an open context, and how um, we can consider academic recognition as well, where that, where that rolls into this conversation. So I'm gonna to start today by just reviewing the uh, university IP. So at UNE, there are various uh, documents and um, policies that outline the um, status of copyright or IP um, for university outputs. So the first one is the 1993 Act, um, which looks at the objects and functions of a university. And um, the links to these will be included in, um, in the slides. What's important about this one is that it's just outlining what the um, role of a university is. And as stated here on the slides, uh, the object of the university is the promotion within the limits of the university's resources of scholarship, research, free inquiry, the interaction of research and teaching and academic excellence. So it has a broad scope of objective. And um, what we're interested in is how that this role of the university then plays into the um, ideas of equity and social justice around the sharing of information in an open format. So if we drill down further, we've got the UNE Knowledge Assets uh, Guidelines or Policy. And um, if we can stay on that page, sorry, Steph, um, that is, um, Thanks. I'll just talk to that just a little bit more. Just, just I wanted to clarify the idea of what copyright is um, from the point of view of UNE and the status of um, your work as, um, it's actually all work that we do, regardless of your status as an academic, a lecturer or a professional staff member. The university owns all of our work, essentially. And it was, it's sort of a, it's a, a, a status that was set up in order to ensure that um, the work of the, the, the people who are employed by the university was retained by the university just in case they left. And um, then they'd lose all that intellectual um, understanding and knowledge if they left. So the university is the owner of the knowledge asset created by staff in the course of their employment. And the only um, proviso there is unless you have um, made an agreement with the university to change that. And so areas that the university does own are materials that you prepare for your teaching, such as course notes, CD-ROMs, websites, etc. cetera. Um, and then within that, underneath that is a concept called moral rights. And that means that the creator, regardless of the copyright arrangement that has been set up, does retain three things, which one is the right of attribution, the other is the right not to have the authorship falsely attributed, and the right of integrity. And then finally, if you want to change or address your uh, copyright situation, and this is called knowledge asset transfer, so from the ownership, uh, copyright ownership or IP ownership of the university to yourself, you do need to contact the DVCR, so in this case it would be Heiko Daniels, um, or his delegate um, who can exercise the university's powers and functions. So there's just a few tips there for you just to set the scene about the, the complex area that we have to deal with when looking at um, taking our work that we've created as an employee of UNE and making it open. 
Um, and then on the next slide, there are um, just a bit of clarity around what that means for us in this area. So again, it's just an overview really of, of what I've said there. Um, but under, if we go to the bottom of the slide, OER under this model. So UNE can assert the right as a copyright owner to license or release an OER. So within that, it's not as if it's, um, it's a no-go. We can actually retain, we can take, or the university can agree to take the, this piece of knowledge and make it an OER. And if an employee independently wants to release an OER, we can do that by getting clearance from um, the, the DVCR, as in the Knowledge Asset Transfer. So it's not a closed shop. Uh, thanks, Steph. So um, how do we then work in this environment to um, create open? And that's, um, I was hoping that we might get a little bit of conversation um, if you were interested to talk about this just amongst yourselves or with us. Um, how, how do we create open if we're working in, a, in an environment where copyright is seemingly restricted? Does anyone have any ideas or any, any thoughts about this or any issues that you've grappled with in the past in this space? I've noticed more, uh, particularly when we're doing the um, ethics applications, uh, particularly, where, we, where there is a provision and the thing is, you know, will, will the data be made open? So mm -hmm. I'm noticing the university is doing that. I'm just wondering, is that sort of, you know, that's, it's almost, we're, we're sort of, com we're encouraged to do that, which is good, but does that sort of conflict with the fact that the university, has the university essentially given us the right to release this stuff, to put it into open repositories as requested by ethics? I'm just, just wondering how that, it's a curious one, but um, I mean, it's good to see that we are, there, we are being encouraged to put things up like Figshare and stuff like that in order to make the data more open. It's certainly a conversation. And I, I would say, how do we work? My, my response to the how do we work in this environment is to advocate. And I think um, there are the universities operating and, and it's, believe me, it's not UNE alone. It's the rapidly changing um, uh, environment that we work in uh, within the open scholarship environment is, is growing in importance and particularly in light of the changes that COVID has brought. Um, the, the conversation around being open is at the forefront now, yet university policy is lagging. So uh, I would say in one of the key steps that we need to take is to be advocates for changing policy and clarifying guidelines and actually um, creating open education um, policies, um, open access policies that feed into um, sort of dovetail into the copyright and intellectual areas, intellectual property areas. Um, and uh, other ways of doing that is um, to join and network with open scholarship groups around the country. So we'll talk about that towards the end as well. Steph, do you have anything you wanted to add here? Um, no, I thought that was pretty clear. Okay. And because I'm aware of time and my tendency to talk, I'll move on. Okay, uh, so from here, I'll take over. Um, for those who are late joining us, my name is Stephanie. I work in the library as digital experience librarian. Um, and what we're just going to have a quick look uh, now are some of the things to consider when, um, if you would like to make some of your teaching um, or research open. Um, because this is Open Education Week, we're focusing more on educational materials. Um, so the question is, what materials can be made open? Uh, what would you like to share? Um, any particular teaching and learning resources, such as your textbooks or syllabus or video, audio simulations, assessments, or anything else that you consider an educational resource? Okay, so um, five things to consider. And if you were here on uh, Monday session, um, Mitch did go through this in a little bit of detail, but there's five options for open if you were considering um, uh, 
making some of your educational materials available to your students in an open environment. Um, and the first one is basically um, a textbook replacement. So um, look at uh, if there is, uh, the cost of textbooks are, are quite large. And if, again, if you're here on Monday, uh, you've heard me quote that some of them are up to a $300 here at UNE. I've heard of higher. And that can form a significant barrier to uh, students continuing study. If they can't afford it, can't access it, um, then they set themselves up to um, hardship and perhaps failure. So what we could consider doing instead of a costly textbook is looking at some um, textbook replacement options. And um, OpenStax is, um, let me see if I can get back to that. OpenStax is a site, is a um, free textbook site. Um, these are peer reviewed, um, openly licensed textbooks which are available. And I know that there are a number of lecturers and of subject areas here at university who are already using some of these free resources. Um, they're excellent quality and cover a wide range of the um, more mainstream subject areas. Uh, what, what one of them looks like, if we have a quick look inside, for example, anatomy and physiology, um, they have a wide range of resources available, great subject listings, you can search within the book, you can download the book. And one of the other things I quite like about um, OpenStax is that they have um, an instructor range of resources here and um, student resources as well, a great range of videos and support material um, ready made for the students. And if you're looking for some um, assessment tips, perhaps some, um, uh, what would you say? guided lecture notes and things like that. These are all available um, if you log in through um, or create an account, a free account with OpenStax. So um, all they need, um, as I was saying, is free is just some proof that you work at, as an educator at, a, at an institution you can upload that and um, they will provide access immediately. So I was saying we have a couple of lecturers already accessing um, this great resource. Um, one, of the, um, one of the second options that's available um, to use is um, creating your own resource. That um, if you have something and uh, something that you would like to share with the public um, or other educators, you can look through the licensing options and the sharing platforms and um, put them out there. So there are a couple of examples of um, where other university lecturers have created their own um, resources for their students. Um, one such one is USQ's Wellbeing and Educational Context. Um, you can set your own kind of license uh, and offer it as um, either a downloadable book or just viewing online. A third option um, is the passive remix of material. And that basically means that uh, if you see a really good, um, really good book out there, for example, something from OpenStax, but it doesn't quite meet the needs of the local environment, perhaps. Um, some of these resources are American centric. And if you'd like to uh, localize it in some way, you can actually take these resources and adjust some of the material. That's a passive remix. And in fact, Again, USQ have done some great work in that area. For example, they took their own, um, or took the astronomy um, textbook there and um, added and localized some of the material. For example, they added a chapter on indigenous astronomy here. Um, so it represented Australia and the content of Australia. They also have um, another resource which is fantastic um, that is academic su uh, success so if you're looking for a good resource for your students um, to help them through study note taking and research then this free book is available as well to use um, next in the list is the active remix um, that is where you uh, draw upon a wide range of resources to create an entirely new one um, so that's always an option. If um, there is no textbook out there, um, no one particular item out there that's going to suit your needs, then perhaps uh, drawing and adapting from a, a wide range of them and bring them together um, and you can then um, publish your own. 
the fifth and final option available to you is the co-creation with students and that is quite um, an effective way of getting students involved in their own learning. Um, it is a very good example of um, creating a high engagement with the open educational practices um, and the students actually become involved in um, peer support, you know, they, they are there to help um, future students in, in their own study as well, using their own experiences. And again, um, USQ have a great, um, great program that's been developed uh, called A Skills Online, and that was developed um, in conjunction with a number of students with um, autism to help them through study and set them up for success in the future. And one of the good things about this one, uh, nine other universities, including international ones, have become involved in this and are adapting it also for their local, um, to their local settings. So there's a few options available to you when you're considering open. Now, I'm just going to get the PowerPoint back up. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so the next step is selecting the license. Which license is going to work for you best? Um, how do you want, uh, what sort of attribution would you like? How do you want it shared? Do you want it um, available in the commercial environment um, or something that is um, purely for um, non-profit organizations? So there's a couple of places out there you can look to get advice and um, we will have a copyright officer soon and hopefully they'll be able to advise you in this particular area. But um, in the meantime, um, there's the Open Education Licensing Toolkit and also Creative Commons, which was introduced on Tuesday's session. Um, they also have a very quick form that allows you to go over what's, um, uh, what's required and what, what can you do with your um, chosen license. Okay, I'll just show you. Okay, for example, the Open Education License Toolkit, uh, just initially agree. Um, so this doesn't answer every question. What it is, is a guide on um, what sort of questions you need to ask yourself, uh, what kind of work it is that you would like to uh, license, who owns it, um, and, and things like that, and points you in the right direction. For example, if you're finding if you want to share a resource, as you can see, it's very, very basic. Are you sharing externally or internally as part of your um, employment? Okay. Uh, yes. What would you like it to be? What are you thinking of? Okay. And where are you going to share it? And it comes up with a general license guide and some advice on how to, um, what to consider and where to go to next for making that resource open. Um, that's, qu that's quite a, a lengthy form, but it does go through every step of the way um, from my conversations with academics who are interested in working or using um, open resource material in their um, courses. Uh, you can go along the path of the Creative Commons. Um, the Creative Commons site has, a, if you have your own work, you'd like to put it out there. Um, there is, um, yeah, it's, it's all your own um, educational work. Then all you need to do is, uh, do you want it shareable? Um, do you want ad adaptations? Uh, if you want, no. Do you want commercial use of your work? No. Then this is likely the most, um, the kind of license you're looking for. And this is what you could put at the bottom of your work. So that everyone knows exactly what kind of license you have and that they need to, um, they need to attribute you. They can't use it for commercial um, reasons and they are able to share. You can also down here um, get a normal icon for your work or a compact version or, and you can just uh, embed the code straight into your work. Um, as I was saying, this one is not a free culture license. So if you do want to make it as openly as possible, the option is allow adaptations of your work, um, commercial, 
absolutely everything is free and um, they, uh, you have your open, fully open license. Okay, so the next question is where to share. Um, it depends on the, um, where you would like to share, what sort of visibility you're looking for. And um, one of the main places you could go is the OER Commons site that's becoming more and more popular. Uh, over here we have OER Commons. They have an open author platform which takes you through how to actually load up your work and make it as shareable as possible. Again, it's a very quick and simple process to log in to get an account with them um, and then click on add OER. They have a guide here if you ever want to find out a little bit more about using the Open Author platform, but it is very, very simple step by step. I find it much easier than Moodle. If you'd like some more options on our library guide for finding OER, there is um, the two major search engines, Oasis and MUM, which are available. They, they have access to over a few hundred different indexes, um, global indexes, where you can go through and search which ones you would like to um, upload your work to. For example, Merlot for, um, or the Happy Trust or so on. There's, there's quite a number of um, sources out there. Oasis and, and MUM will then search those, um, their meta search engines, and they will search those indexes. Okay. So I'll just go down to the next slide. Okay. So when you're looking at formats and where, where to share, uh, some questions to ask, are you just uploading um, resources, uh, open education resources, or are you considering um, open education practice questions? So something that's a little bit more far reaching. If you are um, purely OER focused, just think about the kind of file format um, you're making available to the public. Are they actually able to um, adapt it, take, take, download it and adapt it and um, rewrite some of it if they need to, to make it more um, specific to their needs? Um, what platform you're, you're choosing to share? And um, yeah, think, just have a, a good think about which, uh, which areas that you would like to focus on. However, if you would like to change your overall practice in open education, um, you can look at the extent your openness contributes to the student accessibility, how you create an open environment, um, who are the stakeholders in open education, and um, can OER and open tools and open environments improve your teaching and learning practice? Okay. Okay, so uh, just on second last um, slide of uh, just some formats you might want to consider. If you're uploading to some of these sites um, a PDF document, first question is, is the PDF fully open? Is this something that is easily um, changed or adapted? Uh, for some people, that's, it's not quite as simple to do that. Um, when you're uploading video files, what kind of video files are you considering? Best thing to do is to have a look at the site, the platform that you would like to upload your files to and have a look through what kind of formats they're recommending. For example, um, if you're uploading to the Wikimedia um, area, they have a very specific help area which goes through the file types that they can, ex um, they can accept. For example, um, in their audio files, they can accept MP3 files. However, they do prefer an OGG file because the file quality is better um, and it also contains um, some metadata. So you can have the licensing information behind the scenes, the authorship information. Um, and with the video files as well, they also prefer um, OGG files as well. Uh, these kinds of um, these particular file things, I'm not entirely, uh, I haven't used them myself. However, there are step-by-step -step guides on all of these, um, all of these help pages that would take you through it. Okay, and um, one of the other things to look for as well, and something that perhaps you can consider being a part of is the peer review process. And um, there are a lot of good quality um, open education resources already out there and um, that we, they do rely on um, expert uh, reviews in order to um, make sure that they're um, 
to send the message to other people that those resources are excellent and worth and quality resources for teaching and learning. For example, in um, OASIS, that research methods one, uh, that is an OpenStax textbook, which is coming up here in a search on in OASIS. And this is a particular text which is being used here at the university, made available to the students, it costs nothing, um, is written by some um, experts in the field and is also a reviewed resource. So if you'd look, if you're looking for quality material, have a look for the um, reviewed symbol. A lot of those um, open education platforms will have some kind of review available, but you too can also become a part of that review process. And um, when you're looking for some good material, if you think it's uh, quality material, uh, perhaps uh, letting other, other people know about that. Okay. Okay, over to you, Anna. Thanks, Steph. Um, just to finish off with um, a review of how open scholarship can work towards academic recognition. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that open scholarship has as a foundation the principles of equity, social justice and access. And they are, that's where we, um, we start these conversations. However, we also need to consider um, the impact it has on your scholarly, um, your output um, in scholarship rather. So what I was thinking about was the academic promotion process um, and where OPEN fits into that. So with um, the academic promotions review that took place last year, there were certainly um, discussions around the division of roles in the academic, for an academic into teaching only or research only. And I'm not sure of the contention um, of that in this audience. However, one of the, um, one of the, the areas that was of focus was looking at the requirements um, for teaching and the requirements for scholarship, say, for example, for a, a teaching only position. And I found them interesting because there are requirements across all levels and they include, and as you will be aware as, as academics yourselves, the development of learning materials. And so um, is there space, is there scope for um, uh, open to be included in that to be um, a, a benchmark or an indicator of success? So um, often the areas are, that are benchmarked are things like positive student evaluations or um, evidence of unit reviews, um, positive or improved unit course rates, a student evaluation showing positive impact. And so if we come back to the principles of equity, social justice and access, how does that feed into the conversation around the creation of open uh, resources and um, demonstrating success in those areas um, for students and then your own um, success as a teaching uh, scholar. So that's just a, a broad kind of way of looking at it and also um, part of the other area of, of assessment for an academic when um, undergoing promotion or considering promotion is a record of high quality publications. Um, and exhibition of appropriate scholarly activity. So again, where could we put open into that area? So the, the slide itself talks about other ways of um, getting or getting recognition for it, but I was more interested in focusing on the other kind of recognition, which is as a professional, as, a, as an academic staff member, and how we can include, we can start that conversation to include open into those broader, um, areas of promotion.